Hello, I'm Jonathan Miles Lee. You might have seen me recently on Peter Whittle's interview programme, So What You're Saying Is, for his New Culture Forum. We both thought that it might be a good idea for me to tell you a little bit more about myself and the work that I've been doing for the last 30 years. You've probably never heard of me because I've been working in a radical subculture, which is painting in oils in a traditional figurative style. Obviously, that's not something which has been part of the artistic zeitgeist for a very long time. In the late 20th century and early 21st century, the style certainly taught in art schools and flooding all the art fairs has been more conceptual. And I decided to take a, a route away from that and to ignore the entire gallery system. I've never had an agent or a gallery, but somehow uh, clients have always found their way to me, possibly because what I do is very unusual and specific. I paint large oil paintings which are depictions of historic properties and I think the style looks contemporary but it also harkens back to the way that pictures of houses were executed from the 15th century onwards. There's a rich tradition in this style of painting, uh, especially in Britain. Um, a lot of topographical artists started doing this, especially those who moved to Britain from the Netherlands. Uh, there was an artist called Jan Sibereks who painted Longleat at the very end of the 17th century, beginning of the 18th century, and the pictures that he produced really inspired me to attempt something similar, despite the fact that it's a meticulous style and obviously takes a long time to execute. Uh, my pictures take between eight months to a year to produce, but nevertheless, I painted uh, over 90 of them over 20 years in 22 countries, I think it is now. And funnily enough, even due to lockdown, during lockdown, I've never been busier. So that's keeping me busy and I'm not missing the gym too much. In fact, I have a gym in the house, so that's fine. Um, so how did it all start? I'm going to keep this brief because uh, the interview was quite long and this is intended as an introduction to my Miles Lee TV channel as well. So um, I didn't come from a family that had many country houses in its history. Uh, there isn't a great lineage of aristocrats who owned property or anything like that. But I was very lucky to get an art scholarship to go to Malvern College, which is a wonderful boarding school in Worcestershire. And there I was introduced to a, a sense of tradition. And a lot of the teachers had a real sensitivity to the history of art. I was very lucky that I, I had an art teacher called Bill Denny, who showed us that wonderful series by Kenneth Clark that was made in 1969 called Civilization. And I think we watched the first five or six episodes, which took us through the, the Italian Renaissance. And then he actually took us to Florence and we saw all of this wonderful art and sculpture and architecture for ourselves. And some of the art that I saw in Italy, for instance, those wonderful views of Medici villas by Giusto Utens, um, they also made a big Im impact upon me. I loved the flatness of the images and the decorative quality to them. They were created as lunettes, which is a sort of half a semicircle. They were originally painted as frescoes I, to, above doorways in, a, in one of the Medici villas. And I love the fact that you could interpret them as maps of the estate, but they were quite icon, iconographic. You know, there was something cartographic about it. The trees weren't really realistic versions of trees. They were sort of schematic and idealized. And that's something that I've taken forward with my own work. I'm not trying to create a photographic representation of a property or its garden. I'm almost trying to create an image which is the memory of the experience of going to that property. And then injected into this image, I put a lot of biographical detail. So I'll include the clients and their dogs and other animals and their children. I got that the wrong way around. I should have said that my clients and their children and their animals, shouldn't I? But all of those things add a richness to the image. And I think it gives it a longevity and a reason to go up close and to study these microscopic details. And when I say microscopic, I'm not exaggerating. Sometimes I'll add a little tray of, uh, with a couple of bottles or a couple of glasses, shall we say, of, of red wine. And that will perhaps fit in to the uh, size of my small um, fingernail. So um, it's become more and more difficult to do these things, obviously, because what you can do in your 20s, 30s and 40s is a little more taxing on the eyes in your early 50s. But um, that's fine. I just use a big magnifying glass and I can work away to my heart's content. And um, so let's go back to the beginning. 
When I'd finished my degree in the history of art and architecture at London University, I decided I didn't want to have a, a normal sort of job. I really wanted to be an artist. So how on earth was I going to be able to do this? Because I didn't have a private income. I couldn't just sit at home or rent, rent an apartment or, you know, l you know, relax and just paint in my idle hours. So I asked around a few friends and said, what I really want to do is go and live in a big old country house that has ripped velvet and faded brocade, and maybe I'll get a little time to do some painting on my own. And within a very few days, in fact, um, a girl who was at Malvern Girls' School, which was the, the nearest school to where I was in, in, London, in, uh, in Malvern, said, well, that sounds very much like my friend Cornelia, and I'm going there tomorrow night with my mother. Do you want to come with your mother? I was only about 18 or 19, maybe 19. So um, this happened, this, was, this manifested out of the cosmos, this perfect environment for me. We turned up at a wonderful Jacobean house in North Wales called Plasteg, which was built in 1910, sorry, 1610. Um, it was built in 1610. And uh, within two days I'd moved in to this extraordinary house with the idea of passing idle hours painting. But in fact, I became more or less a house slave and I had to feed all the animals in the house. There were cockatoos, uh, in the library, there were severe macaws in the kitchen, there was a toucan on the top of the, the stairs, um, and there were severe macaws in the old servants' hall, all of which I had to feed every day. Anyway, it was an extraordinary experience, um, and I, I became very fit because I had to take all of the, uh, the sticks out of the fireplaces and uh, clean the house and mow the lawns, basically I had to do everything. I had to drive Cornelia around as well. Um, so during this year, I did manage to do a painting of Plasteg on a piece of wood, a panel, which I found boarding up one of the windows in the coach house. I only had one brush and I think three oil paints, but um, I decided to put the house in the middle of the, the canvas and to put the hills in the background and quite an archa archaic stylized sky in the background and I made my own frame, a big black and gold gessoed frame for the picture. And the result was rather successful. Um, we put it on the wall above the fireplace in the Great Hall, and at the weekends I would open the house to the public and charge two pounds and give a guided tour. Most people wanted to know about the ghosts, but they did tend to linger over this painting. And a couple of visitors said, you know you could make a living painting these houses. And um, I wasn't quite sure whether that was a good idea because it took me an awfully long time painting the windows in this first picture. But a few months later, I decided to put an advert in Country Life magazine, the size of a postage stamp. It was very small. And it said something like, Jonathan Marsley, painter of country houses, and my telephone number. And the morning that it was printed, five people phoned up from different parts of the country. They were all very far apart. They were in North Wales, in Cornwall, um, Gloucestershire. Each one of these people decided to go ahead and commission a painting, and that led to a whole succession of other paintings. After about three years, I saw an article in Country Life magazine by Sir Roy Strong, who was a historian who'd done a lot to save English country houses um, and had, had exhibitions when he was uh, a director of the Victorian Albert Museum about the heritage of Britain. He was, he's well known as a sort of somebody who stood for the heritage of, of, of the British Isles. Um, and in this article he said, I've just finished pleaching the limes in the Elizabeth Tudor Avenue in the garden. And I'm really looking for one of those 17th century artists who can create an aerial view. So of course this was my chance and I wrote to him immediately. And, and I said, I am destined to paint your garden. Uh, he wrote back a postcard saying how much I wrote back the price, um, and that includes the frame, I said. Um, he said, it's a deal, and we arranged to meet, I think on my birthday when I was 24, something like that. Uh, I think it was in 2000, uh, 1995, 1995. So he gave me free reign to create an image which would somehow be an iconic image of the garden. So I thought the garden is more important than the house, so I flattened out the garden, I surveyed everything by um, using sight lines from the cedar tree and Somehow I managed to put to get, pull together this ground plan. Um, I created a crest which included images of him and his wife and the, the family's cats um, to give a bit of whimsy, you know, to lighten up the image. And then we added some roundels, which were spring, summer, autumn, winter, winter showing vistas of the garden, which were difficult to see in this very compressed map-like view. And then I used a key by adding numbers around the garden and putting 
the names of the parts of the garden in a border which ran all the way around the image. Well this was a total success. I'm so pleased that it worked out um, because Sir Roy used this in the fly leaves, of, like, fly leaves of his diaries and he had some postcards printed and sent them off to all sorts of people around the country who all ended up then commissioning paintings from me. Uh, people like the agent for Lucian Freud, the garden designer lady Ara Arabella Lennox Boyd. Um, there were about five or six people. And from that point on, I never had to advertise my work again. It sort of just flowed because there's so few people mad enough, I suppose, to go to so, so much trouble to survey gardens and then to, uh, to reproduce them in oils, maybe as a a pencil or a pen and ink drawing, this would would be uh, you know something that people could cope with. But by doing it in oils with lots of text, text included in the image, it makes the image very time consuming. So that's one of the reasons I'm being able to carve out this sort of niche for myself. I think. Anyway, I carried on. I'll try and keep this brief. But I, I really worked all the way through my twenties and thirties. On painting country houses, the commissions were coming in thick and fast. I did a lot of work for the National Trust making maps, pen and ink maps. My favourite one was in 1995 for Stowe Landscape Gardens, which was commissioned by the lead um, advisor to the Trust, who was called Gervais Jackson Stops, and he really wanted me to create a map which had the atmosphere of the place. He didn't want something which was too functional. He wanted to include images of the visitors who would have been going to the gardens maybe in the mid-18th century. And that was a, a success as well. I, that went very, very well and it led to lots of other commissions to do Dalesford for the Bamfords and other work for the, for the National Trust. Um, but the Prince of Wales saw this map apparently and in 2009 um, I was asked to make a map of Highgrove in a similar style and that's still being used today in the front of the guidebooks. It's used on tea towels, it's used on mugs, all sorts of different forms of merchandise but I'm just delighted that it's, being, it's still being used and I think that's one of the things that I try to do with my work. I try to give the images longevity. I think a lot of artwork, if it's produced in a contemporary style, it dates very quickly. It has gimmicks which lodge it in one particular time period. And what I'm trying to do is what artists did in the past, paint images which have um, resonance for many centuries. And the other thing I do is use a technique to produce these paintings which is very traditional so that there's, a ch there's more chance that they'll last, you know, physically last intact for generations. So I always paint on gessoed linen on panel or oil, oil primed linen um, and I use paints which sometimes I've ground myself. Um, it's all traditional materials of the highest quality so that they'll last and last and luckily the things that I did 30 years ago are still in very good condition so I'm, I'm pleased about that. Um, I lived in New York and in Los Angeles and continued to paint pictures uh, of British properties and ship them back to the UK but I also had the opportunity to paint houses in upstate New York and some uh, craftsmen's homes in Los Angeles by a 1930s artist called Gerald Colcord. I think the first painting I did in America though was a house in Charleston in South Carolina. It was an amazing place in South Battery which is part of Charleston town. One of those, uh, they call them fine antebellum homes which are sort of end on to the street but they have things which they called an English style garden. They're not quite like an English style garden but there's a certain formality to them. So the picture that I did there was the first picture I did in the USA in 2000. So I began the new millennium with a painting in America which was really exciting. And to date I think I've done them in 22 countries. It seems extraordinary. I've never really had much time to look back. I've literally just been working um, on commissions solidly for 30 years. Um, you probably notice that I'm not particularly interested in expressing anything about myself in these paintings, although it could be said that every painting an artist produce, produces is to a certain extent a self-portrait, but that's for others to interpret. I've never been interested in uh, expressing any particular view or opinion through the pictures. For me, 
painting is an act of love and I'm providing a service for the client. I want them to be as happy, happy as possible and I put my soul into every project that I produce. There's no formula that I use. Every property obviously is radically different, has a different style, has a different location, different geography and topography, different sorts of gardens, different building materials. So every project requires uh, a different approach, which is why it's been so exciting for me. It's kept my interest throughout my career to deal with subjects which are constantly changing and also to deal with clients who on the whole are amazingly appreciative. When I say on the whole, they've all been incredibly appreciative. And in fact, the relationships have continued after I've completed the paintings. And that's been a very enriching process because I've taken all of my 90 clients along on the journey with me as I've continued my career. So at the moment, I'm living in the centre of Bath, which is a beautiful city. I think I've really found my, my sense of home. It's a UNESCO site. It's full of the most incredible architecture. In fact, in the centre, you can't find any building which is ugly. So that's a, that's a real thrill and a, a huge privilege to be able to live here. It's located only about an hour and a half from London. Although, of course, during lockdown, I haven't been to London very much at all. Uh, in fact, I've never done so much work. I've been sitting at home, painting away, um, sometimes with a magnifying glass, but I've been very content. And um, the other thing I've decided to do is continue the outreach that I've been practicing through my Instagram account, which is Miles Lee, uh, M-Y-L-E-S-L-E-A on Instagram. I think there's about 25,000 followers, so you, you might recognize me from that particular account. I try to make it quite educational, sometimes a little provocative, uh, but the response to the work that I show there, it's, not, it's very rarely my own work, it's uh, books and paintings and um, sculptures and architecture that I love, that I want to share with, with other people. The response to that has been so positive that I've decided to set up a, a YouTube channel called Miles Lee TV. And um, I'm gonna continue this sort of uh, enthusiastic, really I'm pointing the finger at things which I think are, think are beautiful in order to sort of enlighten people, but also to encourage them to investigate the subjects that I'm particularly interested in. Because for me, I've learned so much through my clients and it's, it's really through people opening my eyes to the culture and the art that surrounds me that I've enriched my life. That I, I think we need people who, who point us in the right direction. That's what I'm trying to say. So the TV channel will be uh, something which I either set up just to have a little chat with you on my own or I might have a guest to discuss their own work because I've through Instagram I've come into contact with some incredible artists all over the world Australia America and um, I think if we have some quite long form interviews where we sort of digress and talk about their lives and what led to them to becoming artists it's also a way of me not focusing on myself I'm not at all really comfortable or interested in talking about my own life or my own process I'm really fascinated by other people, other people's houses, other people's gardens, other people's um, artwork. And that's what I'd like to share with you. So thank you for joining me on this first video and I hope you enjoy the rest of them. Thank you very much.